Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Selective College Admissions. Stand out and get in. I'm Judy Rabinovitz, and I'd like to thank you for spending part of your evening with us tonight. And without further ado, I will get right into the presentation, except that it's not moving, yeah, Jason. We have a little over the presentation. Turn up your PowerPoint. Hmm? PowerPoint. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. So we are both um, broadcasting and recording, and you'll be able to watch this. Um, you know, if, if you miss this or miss part of it, you'll be able to tune in on Facebook Live or on YouTube to be able um, to view it. There are a number of um, handouts for, for this webinar. If you're watching us live right now, um, you'll be able to go to our website and below the webinar description, you'll be able to click on each of those links and have the handouts. And for those of you who may be um, watching the recording, you'll see that the handouts also clickable right below the you know recording, um, the description of the webinar. So the, all of those, um, the five handouts will very much support the information I'm sharing with you this evening. And I'd like to share with you, start by sharing something that um, I just recently read about admissions um, truly being a black box that most of us, or let me say most families, most students, even most admission counselors um, don't really know what's inside that black box. And according to colleges, there's actually a very good reason for it. In fact, this is a statement that was just made by the Dean of Admission at the University of Pennsylvania, saying um, basically that, you know, college is a business. And, it, you know, it, it's like any business that we're only sharing information that's going to serve like our own priorities. So colleges um, because their businesses want lots and lots of they want to be popular they want lots of, of kids to apply and therefore they will do you know things that will help improve you know application numbers so ultimately it's really not necessarily in their best interests in terms of sharing the data about the students who do get in and they feel that there's pretty much nothing that's going to share that particular dynamic, except perhaps for, you know, Congress and Congress can't even um, pass a budget. So what we're going to do tonight is really peek inside that black box. And you will find that perhaps after tonight's presentation, maybe it's more of a gray box um, leaning towards partially being um, see-through. So let's just start with the fact that regardless of who that which you know which college you're looking at that colleges are always seeking you know um, really engaged students who, kids who are very involved in their school community kids who really like to learn um who are you know persistent who show um resilience um have grit you know who just you know want to go out there and set and reach their goals so these are the 10 factors that I'm going to be going over with you this evening, which um, are the, the most important factors in college admissions. So um, let me start with the fact that you really only have about 10 minutes, perhaps eight to 10 minutes to, to stand out and to make an impression on an admissions officer. Because if we were not going, if we were not digital, if we were paper, um, the applications that any admission officer might look at, you know, in a particular day would look just like the stack that you see, you know, on, on your screen. Um, and, and in fact, for, for, you know, several weeks in a row, it could be the, you know, as high as a 20 story building. There's a lot of information that an admission officer has to review in order to decide which pile your application is being placed in. You know, the good one, the bad one, the, the, the maybe one. So it's your job to create an incredibly memorable application that will stand out in really just a few minutes. So 
for the vast majority of students, the you know overwhelmingly most important aspect is going to be the academic record. And you know, just as an aside, you may wonder, well, who are, are those students? The fact that Judy didn't say it was 100% of the students, it was the overwhelming majority. Um, perhaps if you're going to be the recruited um, football player, the prima ballerina, the opera singer, um, you know, have some extraordinary special talent, that talent may weigh more heavily than other factors. So, but for most students, um, your academic record is truly the most important thing. And I'm often asked, well, you know, my GPA, you know, my GPA is a 3.89. That's, you know, almost perfect. Um, is that what colleges are looking for? And the answer is actually no, um, because Colleges review your academic record really with a fine tooth comb. They're not looking just at your GPA. They are looking granularly. They want to see that you've taken at least five core academic subjects every year. And so you may ask core, well, what's core? So core is English, math, science, social science, and social science would be your um, history, government, economics, political science, ec um, what else? Psychology, human geography. Those are all social sciences. So English, math, science, social science, world language. And I'm also going to put computer science into this if it is coding related. So those are the core courses. And colleges are looking for students to have at least five of them every single year. They're also looking for students who challenge themselves, who are getting ready for the rigors of college level work. That means they're looking for the students who are taking like honors, um, IB, um, AP, um, dual enrollment, ACE, basically taking the most challenging courses that they can comfortably manage. And I will have to say that despite the fact that colleges are looking for, you know, students with pretty rigorous um, academics, the the more prestigious the college, the more selective the college, the more rigorous the curriculum needs to be. But by the same token, it's incredibly important that our teenagers today who are so stressed, um, it, it's not just school and the pressures of college admission, it's social media you know, as well, that we don't overwhelm our students. The kids will be successful, honestly, where, wherever they wind up. So you don't ever want to push, you know, a student to take courses that are, are more rigorous or more courses than they can comfortably, you know, handle. But we also want our students to be ready for success in college academics, which means gearing up for it while you're in high school. So if you're looking at the most selective colleges, those that have, say, single digit admit rates, yeah, you really need to load up on as many AP, IB, um, ACE, even dual enrollment in certain circumstances, you know, courses. But if you're looking for a college that might admit, say, 60 or 70 percent, you don't quite need that level of rigor, you know, at all. So um, the level of rigor varies with the difficulty, um, the competitiveness of, of the co that particular college. But it's also important to note that many colleges do recalculate your GPA. They are not just taking that unweighted or weighted GPA that's on your transcripts. Yes, some do, but many of them actually do recalculate. And rather than going into the steps for the recalculation now, I want to tell you that if you go to recalculatemygpa.com, which is part of the you know score at the top, you know family of websites, you will be able to recalculate your GPA the way many colleges do. And one of our downloads for, for this evening is if you'd rather do it by hand, we have all the rules you know, written out in one of the downloads that you can also use to just to recalculate your GPA. Next most important thing, and this may come as a bit of a surprise in the world of test optional admissions, where they, I believe I, the last figure I read was that roughly 2,000 colleges are, are now um, test optional. I'm telling you that the next most important thing are solid SAT or ACT scores. And that is for colleges that are either testing required, like our whole state university system of, of Florida, or let's say MIT, um, but also colleges where testing is optional. 
where scores really don't matter, at least SAT and ACT, would be colleges that have test blind um, admissions, such as the entire University of California system. So uh, let's talk just a little bit, a little, we're going to sort of divert just a bit and talk a little bit about test optional admissions and how that actually can impact an admission decision. And I will tell you that admission is, is definitely more competitive for a college that is test optional. You may say, well, why if it's test optional, why would it be, you know, um, you know, more competitive? And that's specifically because more college, more students apply. Let's face it. If I'm a fabulous student, but I have pretty lousy SAT or ACT scores, which is not uncommon, I might be tempted to say, well, I'm not going to apply to Northwestern or, or, or Wash U or Duke because I don't think, you know, I'll get in with my lousy scores. But guess what? If I don't have to submit my scores and my academic record really looks spectacular, I'm going to be tempted to apply there because I think that my chances are better. Um, but I will add that without submitting any scores, there is definitely more emphasis on your academic record, but it's not just your academic record. It's truly your extracurricular commitment, what you're going to add to that campus community, um, the essays, your recommendations. So everything else is going to play you know, a larger role. But nonetheless, when colleges went to test optional and so many have stayed test optional, um, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, many, many more students have applied, which makes admission more competitive because just because more students apply doesn't mean that more students can, you know, be admitted. So it is truly your decision, students, whether or not you submit scores and you don't need to make that same decision for every college. So most of the students with whom we work do what I'm going to call differential score reporting. I'm going to report my scores where I think they're going to help me, but I'm not going to report my scores if I think they're going to hurt me. So some colleges, yes, and some colleges, no. And although there's not a lot of data to back this up, what we have seen so far from a number of schools is that students who don't submit seem to be accepted at a lower rate. But many, in fact, most colleges do not share the data in terms of the percentage of kids who submitted scores and the percentage of students who were accepted with scores. And the same thing for, you know, without. So we do have some limited data, which I will be sharing with you. If you'd like to find out what a college's testing policy is, short of just going, you know, to their website and, and reading through that, the detail on the admissions pages, there is a wonderful website called fairtest.org that keeps completely up to date and you will find the testing policies of pretty much any college you could name. Um, I would like to um, quote Jeff Salingo, who's a very well-known um, education author, someone who I, I follow. Um, in fact, it was on um, the email blast that I got from him today about, you know, the black box and where he was the one who actually quoted the Dean of Admission um, at Penn. So thanks so much, Jeff. But very early on in the pandemic, he made the observation that um, the admit rate could be significantly higher. And in fact, it was um, for students who submitted test scores than for students who didn't. So this is just an example of, of four pretty selective universities where um, the admit rate for students who submitted was significantly higher than for those who didn't submit. So despite test optional, I would say that really, you know, high quality test preparation, you know, it is a must. Um, and whether that's something a student does professionally or, you know, independently, um, it, you can't just take the SAT or the ACT, you really need to be um, prepared for it. So moving off of sort of the numbers, the data, the GPA, the test score, let's get into things that are a little bit more um, holistic. But before I do, I'm just going to stop to see whether there have been any questions that have come through yet. Uh, only one question. Um, is it better to have a uh, low grades in high rigor or high grades in low rigor? <laughs> So that's a great question. Is it better to have, say, more rigor with slightly lower grades 
or a little bit less rigor in order to get higher grades. Honestly, rigor, I'd say rigor is more important up to a point. So I would rather have a B in an AP course or an IB course than an A in an honors or a regular course. However, by the same token, too many rigorous courses can throw everything off kilter. So you need to know where the balance is. Even though your overall class rank, if you're in a public school, or overall GPA as calculated by your high school is going to be lower um, if you have, let's say, more rigor but lower grades, this will be more respected by, by colleges. But the lower grades with more rigor will not get you, usually not get you in to the nation's most selective universities. Okay, so let's move on and talk about extracurricular commitment. Because popular, I guess contrary to popular thought, is that colleges are not looking for well-rounded students. Yes, well-rounded academically, in other words, a student who may excel in both English and math, you know, right brain, left brain. But in terms of extracurricular, rather than well-rounded, colleges are looking for, let me say, you know, pointed students, um, students who, um, you know, have a focus on one or two areas, hopefully areas that may support their major. Um, a fewer activities, but for much, much longer um, commitment time. So in other words, a student who might play, who's an athlete and who, let's say, plays soccer freshman year, joins the swim team sophomore year, um, does volleyball junior year, tennis senior year, um, that would be despised by colleges. They would much rather see that student stick with the same sport, even though that student is not necessarily looking to be recruited, um, but stick with that same activity throughout. Because remember, I said that their colleges are looking for students who have persistence, who have you know grit. So they very much look for students who take a leadership role and students who have you know a very special talent. But um, and, and and let's take that a little bit further. Um, students who take initiative, who might start their their own project. Um, same thing as a student who has sort of an entrepreneurship, you know, ability, not necessarily starting a business, although that's, that's, you know, pretty exciting, but starting some kind of a club or, or some kind of a, say, community service project. Colleges love kids who are, um, who, who excel at collaboration. So in fact, when creating resumes with my students, I make sure to look for ways in which the students show you know, leadership and collaboration because it's just as important to be a great collaborator um, and be able to have an impact you know, on, on other people. And definitely um, if you're applying for a particular major, having some extracurricular activity that supports that choice of major. So it doesn't look like, oh, I picked a linguistics major because I know that it's easier to get into linguistics, let's say, than it is to business or computer science. But if I haven't done something, let's say, in Greek or Latin in terms of my academics or my extracurriculars, then the college knows that it's, you know, sort of a game that, that, that you're playing. You really want your whole, like, presentation to, to tell some kind of, of, of a story. So fewer activities, but with greater depth of commitment. And it doesn't matter whether your activities are in school, um, personal, you know, hobbies, outside interests, perhaps something related um, to your cultural heritage or, or, or your religion. Um, but they could also be, you know, school-based activities and summer activities. So one is not necessarily better than the other. And what I've tried to do here is just make a list, and, and they're in alphabetical order. There's no, you know, priority here of things that, you know, of, of, of just a range of activities that would be considered, you know, meaningful, you know, extracurricular. But what you don't want to do is, let's say, join four clubs at your school and go and pay dues and not have necessarily things to write or say about those clubs in terms of things that you helped initiate or lead or um, support. Uh, I will just tell you from what I've seen in terms of college admission is that many colleges, especially the more competitive ones, love to see um, kids who are debaters 
and, and who it doesn't matter which category of debate, <laughs> but who, let's say, make it to oct you know, octos to the final eight, um, who um, the kids who are, are involved in journalism and become, you know, editors, kids who are involved in student government, but, you know, work their way up to, you know, an important officer position. So any of these types of activities will work well, especially how, like how you spend your summers. Colleges want you to know that you're doing things that are productive and, and whether you're the bad girl, you know, at Publix or you're at um, the Wharton School and doing one of their business programs for the summer. It's like, I, I can't tell you that one is better than the other. Again, they're just meaningful things that you're, that you're doing to enrich your life and at the same time appease the college um, admission gods. And of course, if you're applying test optional, what you're doing extracurricularly is going to play a stronger role. So we think that it's incredibly important that students have a resume to showcase their act activities, because this is one of the ways you really come alive as an applicant. It's like, well, like, who are you and how are you going to make a contribution to our campus community? And the best way for a college to know how you'll contribute is what have you done so far in, in your local community, in your high school community? And if you have a resume that's more than just a list of activities, but really details of what you've done, how you've done it, where you've taken a leadership role, how you've impacted you know, the lives of, of of other people, you're gonna find that it's much easier to complete the activities page of the common application. Um, the activities page to me is one of the two most important pages on the common app, the other of course being the page with your personal statement. Um, but you only have 150 characters to describe your commitment to each activity. And so therefore, if you've done a resume, you'll actually be able to let's say, steal from your resume, rewrite, making what you're saying, you know, much more concise um, phrases rather than, you know, just concise phrases about what you've done to set yourself apart. And there are quite a number of colleges that, that ask for a resume upload. It's optional, but I will tell you that the word optional in college admissions generally means required with, with very, very few exceptions. Um, this is actually the list from this past year. We're still working on um, gathering this year's list, but they, um, they it changes very little from year to year in terms of, of colleges that um, ask you to upload a copy of your resume. And by the way, if you start a resume in high school, that means that you will always have something like that at your fingertips because you'll keep it up to date as you go to college. You might change the format of it. But when a professor tells you that there's a wonderful research opportunity or an internship opportunity, if you have your resume ready right then and there, the, the chances of your nailing that position tend to be a lot higher. And it's not just the nation's most selective universities, like say MIT and Georgetown or, or Columbia that have been asking for a resume. Um, we're also going to see it close to home at, at Florida State University at University of, of Central Florida. Um, it's certainly quite a range of colleges, about a third of all the colleges on the Common App um, will ask for a resume upload. I've mentioned Common App a couple of times. Let me just, as an aside, say for those of you who are not yet familiar with it, but you will be, that um, over a thousand of our nation's universities do accept the Common App. Some of them don't even have their own application. All 12 of our state universities here in Florida and um, 22 or so of our private universities in Florida um, accept the Common App. Um, all eight of the Ivy League's um, schools accept the Common App. And other than MIT and Georgetown, everyone listed here on this page is a member of Common App. So this can give you an idea of, of what a resume can look like. And yes, they can be wonderfully creative. Um, these are resumes I have permission to show from my students. The names have, have been changed and some identifying details have, have also been changed. <clears throat> but yes, your resume can absolutely have graphics. When you get to college, you would not do that. Maybe your initials, but 
um, you wouldn't do graphics then. But after all, um, kids who are applying to college are teenagers and their resume can reflect, you know, their teenage years. And I like to always do a functional resume and I do create sort of my own categories. In this case, it was science and outreach because I thought they went really well together for a student who was applying pre-med. And this is a resume that's actually color coded. It's, it's crimson um, because this one was uploaded to Harvard and, and it's the exact shade of crimson that, that you know, is Harvard's official color. And for a student who was applying to, let's say, NYU or Northwestern, and if resume was required or you know asked for, um, it would be their exact shade of purple, um, where that you know separator bar is. So this is you know one way you can showcase you know who you are. Here is just another version of of the same thing of, of someone who was a debater. Um, a completely different um, format. This this was actually done through Canva that um, some of my students love to, once we do a resume, love to reformat it using Canva. Um, again, the colors at the top, the red and the black, were specific to a particular university um, to which the student applied. The next most important thing um, will be the essays that, that you write. Common App has a personal statement that goes pretty much to every college to which you apply. There are a few exceptions here and there, but it's it, it's an essay, you know, about you, something very personal that lets the college know a little bit more about like who are you, you know, as a person. And even colleges that are not on the Common App, like I mentioned, Georgetown and MIT before. Um, the all the nine universities at the University of California um, system all have at least one essay. In fact, um, the University of California system has four, um, you know, personal information um, questions that are are asked. Um, basically, they're four essays. So uh, your application essay, your primary one, or in the case of the UC system, four of them, uh, they're just going to tell a story. Of, you know, you're going to tell a story about yourself. You're going to reveal something about um, your 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 goals, your values, your your perspective, um, things that are important to you. Perhaps it's something that happened to you over the summer. Perhaps it's something that happened to you when you were much younger, and that has stayed with you. And of course, they're not just looking at the story itself, but, you know, how well you write as well. That's also incredibly important. So recommendations are important, but they're not necessarily as important as, let's say, everyone thinks they are. Yes, if you're applying without um, scores, they are more important. But I would say, students, you want to find two junior teachers who absolutely love you. They should be core academic teachers. And if you're just starting your junior year, think about a couple of the teachers who you might really, let's say, befriend in an academic sense of, you know, going in early or staying late to just not necessarily ask for extra help, but although that's always a good idea um, when you don't understand something, but, but basically to go in and talk to to say you want to learn more about, you know, some particular concept you're learning, you know, in, in physics that isn't quite clear to you or that you're very excited to, you know, learn more about something that, that you love and you just want to study it more in depth. Um, you want these teachers to know that you're intellectually curious, that you help other students. Perhaps um, you do some tutoring or, or you help students, you know, for other you know, students who aren't as strong as you perhaps prepare for a test. Um, you're volunteering in class. You know, you're raising your, your hand. Um, you're basically almost the teacher's pet, let's say. And if you plan it out, you know, well enough, you know, early on in your junior year, you're going to pick at least one teacher who teaches a subject that is related to your major, if it's possible. So let's say I'm going to be a business major, and um, there are no business courses per se that are, are core um, necessarily, unless it's perhaps there's an IB business course. But, um, you know, a math course is really going to show my quantitative 
abilities. So if I'm applying as a business major or let's say a computer science major, I'm definitely going to want my junior math teacher to write a recommendation for me. And then I'd like to have another core academic that might be very different. So I'm not going to ask necessarily, let's say, two math teachers or two science teachers, but perhaps I'm going to ask my English teacher or um, my history teacher so that a college can see two different, two very different sides, you know, of who I am. And it is absolutely fine, students, um, when you do ask a teacher for a recommendation towards the end of your junior year, don't wait until the beginning of senior year. You want to give them the summer to think about it and, and write and so that things will be ready, you know, your recommendation will be ready early in your senior year. It's absolutely fine to sort of send a teacher um, an email sort of saying uh, just that I would share with you why your class has been so important to me and tell them maybe two or three things that you did in the class that were really meaningful to you because those things are likely to find their way into the recommendation. And you also typically need a recommendation from your counselor at school. Um, some schools have college counselors, others just have, let's say, grade level advisors, but that person generally has to write a recommendation for you. And it's really your job as students to try to get to know that person better so that that, that w when he or she writes that letter of recommendation, there will be much insight into who you are. And parents, it's actually fine for you to even send an email to that counselor um, or school administrator to say, hey, there are some things about Judy that, that you might know that I'd like to share with you. It's sort of your way of saying, hey, I'd like you to put this in you know, Judy's recommendation. You may not know that she did blah, blah, blah. So um, recommendations number six on my list. Your demonstrated interest plays a role. Um, colleges are much more likely to accept students who they believe are going to say yes to them. Colleges are very um, protective of what's called yield. Yield is the percentage of accepted students who say yes back to the college. Um, so it's, it's, it's really important to a college to have a high yield. If you've never shown any interest, if you haven't visited, you've never sent an email to anyone admit in admissions um, when they're, when that university came to your school for a presentation, um, you weren't there, you didn't meet with anyone at a college fair, um, your chances of getting in are slightly lower for many schools. I'm not going to tell you all schools, but if you can develop some kind of a relationship with people at some of the universities um, that you're more interested in, you have improved your chances. So how do you do that? Well, certainly by visiting a college, by going to the campus tour, the information session, and getting the business card of any professionals who you meet and sending a thank you um, email or handwritten note. Or if a, high if, if a high school is hosting a particular university, or if some universities are coming to the area <coughs> to do presentations, you actually do want to go. You want to sit up front. You want to ask questions, introduce yourself, shake hands with the presenter, um, ask for that person's business card so you can send a thank you note. And by the way, if you have your own business card, which you could, um, you can create something on Vistaprint with you know your, your name and your contact information. And perhaps there's some kind of a picture or something on the other side that reflects perhaps your most meaningful activity. I could hand my business card to the admissions, you know, professional. But now let's say that, you know, nobody's coming to your school that you're really interested in and you don't, you know, have the opportunity to go and visit a particular college. You can certainly call admissions, ask for the representative for, let's say, Palm Beach County. Um, and, and by the way, colleges do really admissions. People do like to hear from students and call up and ask for the Palm Beach County admissions rep. That's assuming that, you know, you go to school in Palm Beach County and have a question or two and then ask for that person's, you know, email and ask if it's okay to follow up with an email if you have any additional questions. Don't make a pain in the neck of yourself, but try to establish a relationship with people on college campuses. Or for example, um, there are college fairs coming up next week. I know King's Academy and Suncoast are both having fairs. I think it's on October 11th. 
go to those fairs, um, meet some college admissions people. Sometimes it's an alumni. It may not matter quite as much, but many times it is someone directly from the university. Get their business card. Show them. Give them your business card. Shake hands. Get their brochure. Ask a couple of questions. So that's how you're going to demonstrate your interest. And yes, it will make a difference at some colleges. <clears throat> Something called um, I like to call it intellectual vitality is is also important, especially if a college is more selective. And what what do we mean by that? Well, you know you're you're the kiddo who really challenges herself um you <clears throat> continually asking questions you know in class you're taking more rigorous courses um you've already had ap psych let's say as a junior and you loved it and you now decide to take a dual enrollment course and a higher level you know psychology course perhaps abnormal psych um Maybe your extracurricular, one of your extracurricular activities is that you're involved in academic competitions or you're doing science fairs or you're a debater. These are things that show, you know, intellectual vitality. Or maybe you're, you did a summer program, you know, you went up to Syracuse University and um, you did a summer program in communications. Okay, again, that's intellectual vitality. And it, it doesn't necessarily, by the way, help you get into Syracuse, but it helps you get into any school where you're applying for a related major, or even if you're not. Okay, so demographic and personal characteristics. You know, colleges will will ask you questions. You know about your family, and um, many of them will have lots of information about the particular school you go to, and will know be able to look up your zip code um, because of information college board provides and understand you know have you you know are, are you growing up in an under-resourced you know with an under in an under-resourced neighborhood um in an under-resourced school are you first generation did mom and dad go to college or graduate you know from college is mom a physician and dad is an attorney and, and by the way when your parents are more accomplished, they expect you to be more accomplished. Um, if your parents are less accomplished, didn't go to college, um, you may find that you have a slight edge, you know, in admissions. And also, what's the kinds of things that your teachers may say about you? And if they mention words like how kind or how generous, um, or how you know helpful and interactive you are those are things that colleges very much value and so they are looking at you know who are you what's the world that you've come from they are absolutely evaluating you in context of where did you grow up who is your family where were you at school and i'm going to do one more and then i'm going to stop for some questions unfortunately um Ability to pay has become more and more important. I think this was heightened even more so um, during the earlier years of the pandemic when many colleges lost a lot of money because um, they weren't getting as much money for things like, you know, room and board and many, and many students were taking, you know, a gap year. Um, your ability to pay for some colleges um, can improve your chances for admission, especially if you're on the wait list and, and you're full pay, you might have a higher likelihood of, of getting in. Um, I think that's pretty much all I have to say about that. And before I get into this very final step that a lot of people don't know about that's part of elite college admissions, let me stop and see if there are some questions that I can answer. I'm just gonna go backwards. Uh, it's my understanding that Florida schools do not allow or require recommendations. Is that correct? The vast majority of Florida State Universities do not require recommendations. And um, one of their admission directors once said to me, if I get one, I'm going to throw it in the garbage. And that is specifically because you didn't follow directions. Um, that doesn't mean your guidance counselor or your college counselor or somebody couldn't call a university to share some specific information with you, but recommendations would matter at our, most of our state universities. At what point in the admissions process do they ask for a resume? Okay, so the question is, at what point in the admissions process do they ask for a resume? So the Common App last year, roughly one-third of colleges 
asked you for a resume. Um, again, it was optional. It said, you know, like if you have additional information about your, you know, extracurricular commitment or, you know, just something else you'd like to share with us, you can upload it here. So that is actually part of the application. Um, last year on, and the last several years on Georgetown's application, um, it's a two part application. Part one is very, very straightforward where, you know, you're giving them like your name, rank, serial number, just, you know, basics in order to get, I think from part one to part two, there was a resume requirement. Um, most schools that look for resume make it optional. Many of my daughter's friends need to work a lot, take care of siblings every day, and therefore have very limited time for extracurriculars. Is it okay for them to put these types of activities um, and, and somehow show their skill that way? Okay, this is a fabulous question. It has to do with kids that don't have a lot of extracurricular or maybe even any extracurricular in their minds because they either have to care for a family member or they have to work. Okay, guess what? Those are extracurricular. And I'm so sorry that I didn't actually mention that when I talked about specific extracurriculars. Absolutely, on your common app, if, if you're caring for, for your younger sister that um, you are her caretaker every day after school, that you have to pick her up at three o'clock, you're getting home with her, you're taking care of her, you're helping her with her homework, you're, maybe you're even making her dinner until because both of your parents work until 7 p.m that's absolutely an extracurricular or maybe you're helping to contribute you know to your family's income and that you know you're working a part-time job 12 hours a week that absolutely is an extracurricular and those are both incredibly incredibly meaningful would starting a nonprofit for a disease that you overcame look good would starting a nonprofit um for, you know any kind of a nonprofit look good if anything that you start does not matter what it is, but anything that you start and and have a passion for and grow and let's say get other kids involved. Don't do it completely on your own. A good leader knows how to delegate. So if I'm going to start something, I might get three or four of my best friends involved. Yes, I'm the president, but you can be the vice president. You can be the secretary. You can be you know the treasurer. You can be our social media officer. Um, and I'm also going to get a younger person involved at some point, because once I graduate and go off to college, I want to know that there's a legacy to continue something that I have started. So whether you're starting um, a nonprofit, a 501c3, or, or just a new club, a new organization that is incredibly impactful in college admissions. That's all we got for now. Okay, that's all we've got for now. So let me tell you about the final step in, in college admissions. And this, this is really for the more elite universities, and it's probably something that's not publicized you know, very much. I hate to admit this, but it's really true that the application, the admission process isn't necessarily about you. I know you think it is, but it's really about the institution, you know, and its priorities. You know, what is it that they are looking for? Are they looking for more pickleball players? Maybe. Um, or more esports players? Could be. Maybe they lost their tuba player and they need one. Um, they might need more Russian studies majors or perhaps more students from um, the Southwest. So think about when admission a, you know, when an admission offers, offers are, are made, maybe they're like sort of like a wedding invitation and they've got all the invitations sort of ready to go out. But then the admission officers are going to be sort of like maybe the bride and groom thinking about, well, this one might not come or there's not enough of these kinds of people. And they might start pulling some invitations and, and adding some other invitations and, and making, you know, a decision about who they're really going to invite. Because maybe it's turned out that the president has just said, we don't have enough students from Nebraska, and we really need Nebraska students. But I think you might have too many kids from Florida. So what's going to happen is that the university is going, the admissions officers are going to shape the class. And they're going to take a few of the Florida kids that may, may have been at the bottom of their list, and they're going to 
to find a few of the Nebraska kids who were not slated to be admitted, but were sort of at the top of the almost list and swap out these invitations so that, you know, ultimately in shaping the class, I'm going to make some changes in, in terms of what my priorities are so that I have, um, you know, the balance of, of what I want, that I'm getting enough full pay kids, I'm getting enough English majors, I'm getting enough tuba players for my marching band. So somebody who was slated to be admitted might not be, or the reverse might be true. Um, this was something that I learned from Jeff Salingo a few years ago, when he actually talked about the shaping of an incoming class and where the academic standards that are typically used um, and are used at, you know, throughout the majority of the admission process sort of give way to more ambiguous factors. And you never know what those are. So sometimes when you say, well, you know, she got in, I should get in. But you really don't know exactly why she got in. So I'd like to sort of fast forward to the last three years, you know, since the pandemic and talk about its impact on college admission, because you may have heard that there have been some rather significant changes in admissions um, that were caused by the pandemic. And of course, that spurred the whole test optional movement big time, um, accelerated it beyond belief. And so, you know, if I go back to 30 years ago, and I'd like to say that was when I was applying to college, but it might be a few more years than that. Um, the lowest admit rate for any university was, you know, just 17%. Well, today it's just barely 3%. So that means if we have 100 kids applying to a university, and let's face it, let's pretend that we're applying to, you know, top tier university, the most selective university, you know, in the nation, chances are most of the kids who are applying are right up there. They're kids with straight A's, with every rigorous course they could possibly take, where they probably all should get in. But 96.6% .6 of them are not going to get in because this is what has happened in the last three years. So if I compare, you know, 2020, sort of like just as the pandemic was beginning to like this past year, um, the kids were applying, you know, more kids were applying to colleges. There were more underrepresented minorities, more first generation, more international students. Um, the number of students, you know, that were filing applications was up 21%. That's huge. And if I look at the number of applications that these kids submitted, because these kids were not just submitting the average number of applications, the average was actually moving up. That was up by 30%. Um, large public universities saw greater gains than private universities, and the more selective universities saw greater gains than less selective universities. And I want to give you some actual specifics in terms of showing you how much admissions rate fell. Um, Northeastern might be a perfect example. Um, you can see back on when um, during the 2020 to 2021 application cycle, Northeastern was admitting almost 20% of the students who were applying. In the most recent two years, um, maybe about 7% were admitted. So, you know, it's fallen very, very significantly. Um, if, if you look at all of these, you're going to see you know, drops certainly from the first year to the second year. And in most cases from the second year to the third year, take a look at NYU, how much that, you know, it has dropped from almost 15% to, you know, less than 10%. That is a very significant drop. The pandemic actually accelerated what had been happening. So um, the graph the chart that we created um, basically using AI, to compare the admission rates of Ivy League universities versus the number of applicants. So you can see that the number of applicants, sort of the dotted lines, um, increased over, this is over, you know, 21 years. And the, the um, percentage of students who were admitted kept falling. So this is a trend that's been going, been around for, you know, more than 20 years, 
but has been vastly accelerated by the pandemic. Um, we went a little bit further and we looked at um, the uh, sort of the, sometimes they're called the IB plus, all, all of these schools are considered sort of uh, the highly rejectives because they reject such a huge percentage of the kids. But when you look at places like Stanford, MIT, Caltech, Chicago, Northwestern, um, uh, w which are often you know grouped in the same category as, as the Ivies. And by the way, the Ivies is really just an athletic um, conference of, of eight universities. But again, you can see exactly the same pattern and increasing number of applications and decreasing application rate. But another phenomenon that has also become even more pronounced um, in the last several years is the fact that if you are the early bird with your applications, if you are applying early decision or early action, which are two different decision plans, but they both what, what they share is that you apply early, usually by November 1st. Although in the case of Florida State University for Florida students, it's October 15th, which is the earliest that any college is allowed to set its, you know, a, an early date. But if you apply early um, to a college that has one of these early programs, you do find out early. Generally, you find out before Christmas. And um, the admit rate for students who apply early tends to be very significantly stronger, higher than the admit rate for students who apply regular. So for example, if I look at darkness, it's, and I picture because it's sort of right smack in, in, in the middle, um, you know, almost 20% of the kids who apply early to Dartmouth get in. Um, but this, but for the students who apply regular, which means the deadline most likely is in January, um, only 6% got in. Um, that's, you know, roughly, you know, three times, you know, three times a better rate for admission. And you can see for all of these um, colleges who were, you know, IB plus schools, um, it was, I don't want to say easier to get in early, but certainly less difficult to get in early. Um, let me just explain to you what some of these abbreviations mean, though. ED, early decision. Early decision. If I apply early and I get in, I must go. I am obligated to go. I can get out of it if there's a very, very, very good reason, like there, there was some very significant loss in my family, loss of income, loss of life. Um, but generally, you know, 99% of the time, at least, um, it's a firm commitment, which basically says I may apply to one college early decision. And it should be the college that I am like dying to go to. I have visited a number of colleges. I have fallen in love with a few of them, but one head over heels more than any other college. It's like, I feel like I would kill to go to that college. I'm likely to apply their early decision. There are some negatives to applying early decision, like you can't compare your financial aid packages because if I apply early decision and I get in, I must withdraw all of my other applications since I'm obligated to the, go to that college. I cannot wait and see, well, did I get into X or did I get into Y that I applied to regularly? So there is a tremendous advantage both to the college and to the student to apply early decision. But please don't apply early decision to the college on your list that you feel is the hardest to get into. No, apply to the college that you have visited and truly fallen in love with and feel that this is the college for you. Um, let's see. Some MIT has something cool. And MIT, you can see there's it's not a huge difference. It's still a difference, though. Um, they have early action. I apply early. I find out early. But I'm not bound. So I can actually you know, find out way before March, which is when you find out most college admission decisions, you know, if I've gotten into a place like MIT. And it's also possible that I might have applied early decision to Dartmouth and at the same time early action to MIT because that's allowed. However, what I could not have done is applied early decision to Dartmouth and apply to Yale through SCEA, um, single choice, early action, because Yale's single choice early action specifically means that you're making a single choice. If you apply to Yale 
early action. You cannot apply to any college early decision. And the only time you can apply to any other college early action is if it's either a state university, like for example, University of Michigan, which is one of the hardest um, schools for ad public institutions for an, um, a student to be accepted to. They do offer an early action. It is a state university. So I could apply to Yale single choice early action and also apply to Michigan early action. However, I could not apply to MIT early action because MIT is not a public university, it's private. I could not apply to Yale single choice early action and apply to say the University of Miami early action because the University of Miami is private. Again, it's not public. So these are almost like airline rules that it becomes very, very, you know, confusing, but all of these colleges do have the rules on their website explaining. And if you're not sure um, about the rule, you always call admission to ask. Remember, they like to speak you know, to students. They like to speak to students much more than they like to speak to parents. They really don't like to speak to parents very much. So if you can apply early to a university, you're going to most likely be improving your chances. And I wanted you to see that, that this rule about early, or, or I don't want to call it this rule, but, but this philosophy about applying early to improve your chances isn't just at the Ivies. It is across the spectrum of selective colleges. So there's a full range of selective colleges that offer either early action or early decision. And you can see that in, in every case, applying early gave you an advantage. So my rule um, to every student with, with whom my team and I work is that if you are applying, uh, for every college you are applying to that offers early action, as long as it is not a restricted early action, please apply to every one of these schools early action. And for some of my students who let's say apply to 10 or 15 schools, they may find that 11 or 12 of them offer early action. So their goal is to get everything done and in before the November 1st deadline, or for the few that have October 15th before that deadline. It's also important to note that the with the advent of, you know, or or, or the I, I would say the emphasis on early action, early decision, many colleges fill roughly half of their class or even more early. And the early pool is always smaller. Let's face it, many kids procrastinate. Many kids don't have great college counseling, haven't had the time to yet look at particular colleges and may not get their applications done until December or January. And some colleges, by the way, don't have deadlines until March or April. But what we're seeing is that roughly half the class is filled early, which says for those of you who are not seniors who are listening to this, this is the time to really sort of jump on the bandwagon, think about visiting schools, learn, you know, researching schools, learning more about schools, and making sure that, you know, you're ready for the, you know, SAT, digital SAT, by the way, digital PSAT coming up, no more paper SAT starting in, in March, this December is the last paper SAT, um, but ACT is, is going to be paper for a while longer. But anyway, making sure that, you know, your curriculum, your scores, your extracurricular, you know, pretty much that everything is lined up and that you've done enough college research to be able to get many of your applications in early in your senior year. Um, want to just let you know that you know if, if you've enjoyed you know this evening's presentation there's plenty of additional um webinars that we've done that are on our website giving you you know great information for it for college um admission to co college i guess you can tell that you know we really love to share information one of the most recent ones that i've done and i've, I've been thinking about doing this particular webinar for a long time and finally put it together this year because it took a long time to put together is what you can absolutely do to make sure that your common app is not common, that it's uncommon, that it really helps you stand out. So that in those eight to 10 minutes during which time colleges review you, um, 
you're going to make even more of an impression. So I, I hope you'll go um, to our website or YouTube channel and you know find our webinars, you know, and play them. Um, every summer we do um, at least one college admissions boot camp. They are you know group sessions. They are very very low cost. Um, if you go to a school that you feel could benefit from having a boot camp, you know, call me, get in touch with me. You know, we're happy to do boot camps. We do these at, at, at different high schools as well as doing them, you know, in our own facilities where you get much of the application process done um, either right before school begins or in the first several weeks of school. This time of year, we do special promotions that if you've written an essay and you're not sure if, if it's really going in the right direction, um, we'll do a, a very thorough review and give you great advice um, moving forward, you know, for, you know, very low cost. Um, we well, I want to wish you all the best, best of everything in, in the world of, of college admissions. Um, we hope you'll tell your friends about us and certainly call us or email us if you have any questions. And let me just see if there are any other questions that I can answer for you this evening. Someone asked if we offer help for preparing a resume. Do we offer help for preparing resume? Absolutely. Um, that's actually like one of my pet projects. I love helping kids um, learn how to ex really Ex, you know, express themselves on one or two pages and um, make themselves stand out. So yes, we can help you with that. How can you apply to multiple early action schools if you're obligated to attend if accepted? Okay. How do you apply to multiple early action schools if you're obligated to attend if accepted? Here's what you do. Um, let's just say that I'm going to apply uh, early decision to Emory University. So that's due November, November 1st. Emory has no restrictions for early decision. The overwhelming majority of colleges with early decision have no restrictions whatsoever. So I'm going to get that application in before November 1st, and it's binding. If I get into Emory, I am withdrawing everything else. I'm not waiting to hear from Emory before I apply elsewhere, because I've got to get all my other essays done. Most colleges have multiple essays. Okay. So my Emory application is probably going out next week. Okay. I'm going to finish up my application for, let's say, University of Michigan, which has a few additional essays beyond the personal statement, same personal statement as Emory. Um, Northeastern has an early action. Let's see, SMU, Southern Methodist University, has an early action. University of Denver has an early action. Uh, let's see, I think Indiana University has an early action. Um, none of these early actions are single choice early action, which is also called, by the way, restricted early action. There are six or seven schools in the whole country that have a restricted early action. In fact, if, if you email me, I will send you the write up I have on all those colleges and what the restrictions are. Um, so if I'm applying early decision, I can absolutely apply early action, but I can't apply to somebody that has single choice early action like Harvard, you know, or Yale um, or Princeton um, or who else, um, Stanford. So as I said, there's six or seven of them that way. Ah, but let me give you one more. This will hopefully not confuse you too much more. Let's just say that Emory defers me. Basically, what they're saying is they're looking for more information. They're going to put me into the regular decision pool if they defer me. So I'm going to get my decision in March. I might have a little bit of priority there because I've made a commitment to Emory. They know how much I want to go there. And if they eventually admit me, I'm not obligated because once they defer me, they let me out of that early decision. And I will send them my first semester grades. I may send them an update letter. I may send them other information about me. But you know, when I applied to Emory Early Decision, I couldn't decide between Emory and Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt has two rounds of early decision. So now that I'm no longer obligated to Emory and Vandy's early decision two deadline is in early January, I can send an application right now to Vanderbilt early decision two. And by the way, if I had just, let's say, filed a regular application to a Vanderbilt 
maybe around December 10th. And then around December 15th, I found out from Emory that I didn't get in. I can actually call and most likely email Vanderbilt and ask them to change my application from regular to early decision two. When I find out from Vanderbilt, which I believe maybe let's say in sometime in February, if I got into Vanderbilt early decision two, I am now obligated to Vanderbilt and I have to then withdraw all my other applications. And what happens if just as I'm withdrawing them, I get a phone call from Emory saying, Judy, we're not going to mail anything out for another two or three weeks, but we wanted to let you know that you're going to be accepted. It's too late. I can't go to Emory because they let me out of early decision and I now have a binding commitment to Vanderbilt. There are many colleges that have two rounds of early decision. In fact, Emory also has two rounds of early decision. So if I love Emory and I love Vanderbilt, I just have to decide which one I'm going to do ED1. And if I need to apply to one or the other, the other one for ED2, I can. I'm sorry, this is confusing. And let me add one other thing. There's some colleges that have something called rolling admission. They tend to be less selective schools, but they're still selective. Like, for example, University of Central Florida. Um, which is the largest state university in Florida and the second largest state university in the country at over 60,000 undergraduate students. They do rolling admission, which pretty much means they'll make an admission decision within, it used to be just a few weeks after you applied. Now they're not gonna start making admission decisions until sometime in November but it's still earlier than you'll hear from most other colleges that you apply to regular because you wouldn't hear from them until March. So if you're if any of the colleges on your list offer rolling admission, your goal is to get those applications out as early as possible. Typically, the earlier you apply, the sooner you'll hear and the better your chances. What if you've been accepted early decision, but are unsure if you can afford to attend? Should you find out before applying what the financial aid packages are? Will you be less likely to be offered any scholarship money if you've been accepted early since they're now, you're now obligated to attend? Okay. So let's say, you, let's, it's, it's, there's a few scenarios here. So I've been accepted to the college of my dreams, early decision, and um, I didn't, I didn't discuss with my parents initially, like, you know, what their budget was, and they just let me apply. Um, and I'm going to find out afterwards that, okay, let's, let's go back to the example of Emory. I want to say that Emory's tuition, room board, books, fees, everything is somewhere probably in the seventy dollars to $80,000 a year range times four. And let's say I was accepted early decision. And Emory doesn't offer me any money whatsoever. Let's just say that that happened. And I go to my family and I'm so excited. And my dad says to me, Judy, we can't afford 75,000 a year. You know, we can only afford $50,000 a year. You can't go to Emory. Okay. So a couple of things. To avoid heartbreak, please, 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 families, parents, students, discuss with each other, you know, what the budget is and if my parents had said to me you can only go to a school if it's you know because you know, we this is all we can afford then i might have done would have been able to do perhaps a bit more research to find out what kind of you know financial aid or merit-based scholarships you know were offered but will emory let me out of the early decision if my family says i can't afford it the answer is yes and honestly I've, I've had a few school students over the years who, after being accepted early decision, had a real change of heart. In fact, one of them um, wasn't working with me. He was working with another educational consultant, and he was ex accepted to Colgate University early decision, um, and he was very unhappy with it. And he, the person he was working with had said to him, that's not an excuse to get out of it. Family knew me for other reasons, and they engaged my services to say, can you help us get out of it? And I said, well, why do you want to get out of it? And he basically said, I'm totally nervous to be that far from, from home and to be that cold and that remote. 
I said, you know what? That's a very reasonable director of admission. I want you to call her. We can rehearse what you're going to say. You can do it from my office. Um, and he did um, after a lot of rehearsing. And he explained about his anxiety and the distance from home and, and the remoteness of the school. And I can say that that director of admission could not have been more sympathetic and said, I understand completely. I have children. I understand what it's like to be that far away. You're still accepted. You're not bound. We do hope you're going to decide on us. Um, and I want to thank you for your honesty. So colleges can be very generous. I don't want to suggest that you should always do something like this. Um, and there are some colleges that if you call in advance will say to you, if you don't think you can afford us, don't apply for early decision. There are other schools that will not give you that information and to say, look, we meet full demonstrated need. Of course, if you have no need, but your parents say, well, I'm not spending more than X number of dollars, that's you know a different story. You do have to, you, sh I, you should check with the university in advance to make sure that it could be affordable for your family before you apply for early decision. I thought that early action in Florida does not mean you have to accept it if you get it. Okay. Early action does not mean you have to accept it anywhere at all. Early action is just action. It's not a firm decision that means you must go. So I can apply to as many early action schools as I want, unless one of the schools is a single choice early action, and then I have to read the rules to see what the restrictions are. Okay, so if I'm applying to Stanford, single choice early action, because that's their only early action, you have to read Stanford's rules to find out if you're allowed to apply early decision elsewhere, and I don't believe you are, and what the restrictions are for early action elsewhere. If you have to apply early action because of a certain scholarship that's only available to early action students, yes, you can do that. If you have to apply early action at the state university like FSU that offers early action, yes, you can do it, but you really have to know the rules. Uh, is it possible that more early decisions are accepted because more students apply during that period? I don't, uh, that more, more early decisions are accepted because more students apply. I, I don't think that if the number of students applying, you know, necessarily doubled, I don't know that a school would, would accept much more than half their class because okay, it's an early decision, which could be challenged, by the way, in the future in the Supreme Court, because they feel that there is an, you know, there's an advantage to a wealthy or a well-resourced student who's going to, like for instance, know a better webinar like this and learn more, or goes to you know a, a good public or private school with, with great you know college college counseling. Um, <laughs> but I don't think that they're going to try to fill too much more than half their class because they really need to have, like they want this core so that they sort of know what you know what the shape of the class sort of looks like so they can add you know onto it. But I really don't think that they're going to apply, you know, take too much more than half, half of, of a class. And even that's a lot. Has ROTC and other programs similar to it helped significantly? If you're applying to ROTC to ROTC, in other words, that's, um, <clears throat> let's say you've been in ROTC, you know, in high school. And, you know, you've enjoyed that military aspect of it. And you're applying to a college that has ROTC, by the way on its campus, just because college says, oh, we have ROTC, you really need to look to see which ROTC it is. You know, is it, is it Army? Is it Navy? And is it on your campus? Because if it's on another campus and you're going, you know, back and forth, you're going to lose, you know, a lot of time. Can that help? And yeah, it could, it could be a very slight advantage because maybe the, the ROTC director is saying to admissions, listen, I need 40 kids this year. So if, you know, you're only, you know, right now, you know, this could happen in the shaping that, you know, we don't, it doesn't look like we're going to get 40, you know, I want you to add a few more. And there are some wonderful scholarships available through ROTC. Are ED acceptances, uh, acceptance percentages skewed by special acceptances such as athletes, significant donors, et cetera? 
Okay. So are ED acceptances skewed? Um, yes. Um, many colleges the um, that are recruiting, let's say, D1 athletes, Division I athletes, many of them are coming in through the early decision route. So, um, and many of them may also be coming in through a legacy route, but we're finding that there's a number of colleges that are just given up legacy admission, which means if mom or dad went there, you used to have an advantage, but you might not like anymore. So there are gonna be certain spots that are, are, are filled, you know, could it be filled by a wealthy donor's, you know, child? The answer is yes, it's not supposed to be, but you know, it could be. Um, you know, they, listen, they might need the extra bit of its library, although we didn't have the kind of money to do that with, you know, with, with our children or our, our grandchildren. Um, but yeah, th th it is skewed to some, you know, to some extent. So for instance, when, you know, if the admit rate at a particular um, top tier university for early decision is 10%, you know, it could be that half of those spots have really, you know, gone to, you know, special students. Um, oh, you know what, there was a question before, um, if I apply a early decision, am I lowering my chances of getting some kind of a scholarship because I, the college knows I'm now bound. If you ask the colleges, they are specifically saying, no, it is not, you know, going to lower your chance, let's say, to become an Emory scholar, for example, which is, um, you know, given to, you know, I don't know, 40 or 50 students, you know, per year, just because you got an early decision. Um, how much I believe it, it's, you know, it's difficult to know. I, that would not deter me from applying early decision and um, competing for a prestigious scholarship at that university. Do you have any suggestions for how to make yourself stand out if applying to the most competitive schools where nearly all applicants have perfect grades, high test scores, and impressive extracurricular. Okay. So how can you make yourself stand out? Because let's just say that I have the opportunity to take 12 AP courses um, by the time I graduate high school. On all the ones that I've already taken tests on, I've gotten fives, you know, the highest I can get. Um, my ACT is a 35 or 36, and it doesn't matter which one it is. You know, it's really perfect. Um, I'm president of my class. I am um, nationally ranked in terms of debate. And I've started my own um, nonprofit organization. And my teachers love me. They've written the most incredible recommendations. So first of all, I have a really great shot of getting into pretty much any school I've applied to because I look pretty special. But I think one of the things that will make me stand out will be my essays. Um, also, it's like who I am as a person. If it comes across that I am very kind, very generous, very, very caring, um, I think that's that's actually going to help me. Um, also, if I've come from a low income background, that could help me pretty significantly. Um, I don't think that, you know, if, if I'm a minority race, that's not as likely to help me, let's say, as it had in the past because of the Supreme Court ruling. However, my essay might be writing about how resilient I am and how I over overcame some particular prejudice. Um, and you know what that meant for me, but you know, realistically there, there is, is no magic formula. Um, we make sure that our students have a range of, 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 of schools and their college list that for, for the students, some of them may be incredibly selective. Some of them are pretty much sure things or cl as close to that as possible, but there are schools in the middle of varying levels of selectivity. And, you know, we want each of us, you know, we work with each student individually and, and you can do the same on your own to, to just really stand out and feel like, you know, you're, you're special and that um, you're doing things that are meaningful to you. Um, and it, honestly, maybe your full load of extracurriculars is the fact that, you know, you're working 25 hours a week to help support your family. 
that's fine. Um, you're you're going to look just as great as you know the national debate winner, um, because you're really devoted to, to your working an extreme number of hours and still getting phenomenal grades. Um, get teachers who love you and are writing great, you know, great recommendations. So, you know, th there there is no magic, but li just little things. Um, the way the recommendation is written, uh, you're showing interest, you know, in the university and developing a relationship with someone in admissions. Um, little things like that can help a lot. How do colleges know your ability to pay, and will they know if you have bright futures or foreign or prepaid? Okay. Okay. So, so first of all, they can easily tell if you're going to have, you know, bright futures, and that's not be because it's it's based on a GPA that's calculated very differently than your existing GPA on your transcript, and it can't actually be determined until after you graduate because you have to have four years of English counted, you know, in that. Um, <laughs> whether you're going to get bright futures or not. Um, is not going to influence whether you're accepted to UF, FSU, you know, USF, FAU. It, 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 they're going to ignore that. And it doesn't matter to them whether, whether you have Florida prepaid and whether it's included your residential um, experience, you know, or not. You're going to be judged based on, on your application, you know, period, end of story. Um, many applications specifically through Common App, do we ask if you're going to be applying for financial aid? Um, that has always bothered me, um, seeing that on an application, although colleges will often tell you that our financial aid people are in this office, our admissions people are in this office, and they don't talk to each other. How much do we believe that? That's up to you to just, you know, to, you know, to decide. But um, many colleges will ask you, like, what kind of work do your parents do? So, you know, if, if mom is a bus driver and dad is unemployed, they have an idea that you're coming from a low income. They can also look at your zip code and make some generalities. Oh, she comes from um, 33418. Mm, that's, you know, a, at least a middle class, if not upper middle class area. So maybe her family, you know, makes more money. Um, if they see that mom is president of a corporation, um, dad owns um, dental practices all over, they may assume that hmm, someday there may be a building named after you on that college campus. Um, it's hard to say whether these things are, you know, to your advantage or not. Colleges do love to brag about how many Pell Grant recipients they have. So uh, you're a Pell Grant recipient. It means that, that, you know, your family makes below a certain income level. And so there's been tremendous emphasis on how, what percentage of accepted students are Pell Grant recipients. And so, you know, or first generation that can help you tremendously. You know, when I went to college, we were all first generation because most of us didn't, are old enough that we have parents who might not have gone to college. So we there was no fuss made over that. But if you're a first generation, you might have a pretty nice advantage over your best friend whose you know, parents are both well-paid professionals. It's hard to say how it would really impact college admissions and, and what that college's priorities are, what that college is looking for, who they're sending an invitation to. Is there any mechanism to find out your dream school's priorities? <laughs> uh, the only mechanism perhaps to find out the dream school's priorities is, gee, maybe if your father is the president of the university or director of admission, there, there is no way to find, to find that out. Um, I mean, one year I did get a call from a very small, prestigious, small liberal arts college that um, I had a relationship with admissions who asked if I was working with any tuba players and this really did happen um, and I wasn't the only one who got this call um, you know asking because they all their tuba players were graduating and their marching band was you know very important to them unfortunately I didn't have any tuba players I don't really often have any tuba players it's it's impossible to know you're it, this is like rolling the dice um, remember I told you that um, college admissions is, is, is like that black box. 
I've given you a bunch of the secrets, but there's no way to really get inside fully that black box. Uh, where uh, can you can you explain where the student submits a resume? Is it through the Common App? My son never heard about a resume. Okay. So where does a student submit a resume? Some colleges in the Common App, and um, I did have a screen, for, you know, further back that listed some of those colleges. Um, will absolutely say on their questions page, okay, or it could be in their supplement, but okay. So every college on Common App um, gets the basic six pages of Common App. There's a seventh page called Courses and Grades that uh, some colleges request. It's a few dozen colleges, but then every and the, and everybody gets the same information. Although you can change it between colleges, not that there's any reason to, other than the score thing. Every college has its own unique questions page, which and it starts off by saying these are the questions that are being asked by you know Northeastern University, and you know it's going to ask you are you applying early action, early decision, what's your potential major? Because you know I can tell one one college I'm going to major in computer science, and I can tell another college I'm majoring in linguistics. I mean there's no reason to do that, but I could. Um, so it's within that questions page where um, sometimes it asks you like. What extracurriculars do you plan to get involved in on college campus? And it may then say um, if if you have anything additional you'd like to add about your extracurriculars, you can do it here, and where you can upload a PDF. So there, there are some colleges that can do that in the supplement if they have a supplement. Not all colleges have a supplement. Okay. Um, last year, Emory University, which is on Common App, did not ask for the resume in Common App. It asked for the resume to be submitted through their portal. So every college has a portal through which you can check your admission status and you can check, oh, they've gotten you know my recommendations or they got my transcript or what have you. Um, but sometimes they ask additional questions on their portal. And so it's very important after you submit an application that and and you you get an email back or you get a state something back from the you know that says that hey you've been submitted but that you check on the portal to see if on the portal they ask for it so let's just say that the questions page didn't ask for it the portal didn't ask for it but you have a resume okay i i have a trick that i do with my students um that my whole team of educational consultants does with, with our students for any college that didn't ask for a resume if there are a few of the activities that a student was involved in that had significantly more information than could be expressed in the um, on the activities page in the 150 character descriptions, you can take advantage of a section of Common App. It's at the bottom of the writing page. It specifically asks if there's anything else you would like to add. I can check off yes. I can copy and paste in from my resume those activities that are much more meaningful to me but for which 150 characters did not adequately describe exactly what i had done so maybe it's three of my activities perhaps from my resume i will have to do some reformatting because you're copying from let's say a google doc or a microsoft word doc you're copying into a text box so it does lose formatting, and so you're going to have to play with it a bit. Um, and I must be sure to do that only for the colleges that don't ask for, you know, give you the opportunity to upload a resume. So I typically make a list in advance. I ask my students to do that, to go through every one of their questions pages and every one of their supplements to see if a college gave you the opportunity to upload a resume. And I made a list, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, so that I knew whether to send additional information or close off that area. It's the same thing that you do with your test scores, essentially, because I may be sending test scores to some colleges and not to others. So I may self-report on Common App. And for a college for which I say, no, I'm not going to share my test scores, I'm actually going to pull them off Common App just in case. Um, because I always worry that a college might have access to them, even if I got, even if they got them unintentionally. 
So I hope that answered the question about the resume. Will a school like UF defer? If so, do they tell you? Uh, does UF defer? Yes. Um, I believe that UF will admit, deny, and defer when they make their admission decisions, which is generally around the middle of February. Um, if you download, there was um, one of our downloads um, had the SUS State University system. It has the statistics for admission for all 12 of our state universities um, for, this hat, for this current year. In other words, for the kids who are currently freshmen, the percentage of kids who are accepted summer and fall, um, mid 50% range of SAT, ACT, and GPA, the way our state university calculates it, um, so that you, first of all, you can look and see what you think your chances are of getting in if you fall well within those ranges. Um, but yes, they might admit, they might deny, they might defer. Um, most colleges that defer, I would say the overwhelming majority of kids who are deferred do not get in. It's like, don't hold your breath, make other plans, stay on the wait list, um, keep your fingers crossed, but make plans to go elsewhere just in case. Uh, where is the early action option located in the Common App? Okay, so the question is, where is the early action option located? So there's two places. Um, First of all, when you're filling out the questions page, the very first part of the questions page for very uh, virtually every single college will ask you, are you know, are you applying for like summer, fall, winter, spring, what, whatever they have? Um, do you plan to live on campus or off campus? And then it says, you know, what admission plan are you picking? And there's a drop down. So if the college offers early action, you'll find it right there in the beginning of the questions page. The other thing is that Common App has something called the requirements grid. It takes all 1,000 colleges that are on the Common App and it lists specifics of the requirements, like deadline dates, whether you know whether they need recommendations, whether they have early action, early action one, early action two, there's two of them, early decision one, early decision two, rolling admission, you know, what, what they offer. Um, when you're on common app you're actually able to um let me think if i can remember which page it's on um i can't remember it's not on the common app page page itself um it might be through call i might be through the college search or it might be on um your college list but one of them gives you an option sort of at the very top right um where, where you can click on requirements grid and you can either get it for just your colleges or you can get it for all the colleges on Common App. I, at the beginning of the year, and then periodically I download the PDF of the requirements grid. It gets updated every so often. And th therefore, when I have a student who's asking me about a deadline, I actually have a shortcut key on my computer, press that key, and I immediately can look up the deadline dates of every college that's on Common App. Um, why does step parents income play a role? What if they're not contributing? Okay. Um, I, I'm, the question was, what if, you know, what, what kind of role does step parent play? What if they're not contributing? I'm going to tell you that I know enough about financial aid, need-based financial aid to make me dangerous. It's not my area of expertise. I can tell you about a thousand colleges and what their campuses look like and what their best majors are and what the social life is all about and what it takes to get in. But I can't tell you beans about financial aid other than the fact that this year's FAFSA, which is the, um, let's see, um, federal, it's the federal aid um, form that's used for financial aid at every college in America. They all require it if you're applying for need-based financial aid usually comes out October 1st. Um, this year, it's going to come out sometime in December. It's going to delay, it may delay financial aid offers at some colleges. Um, but I would suggest that you ask your question of a financial aid expert or ask a particular college. Um, there's also another form called the CSS Profile. Um, it's a form that's created by the college board that many private colleges also use the CSS profile. 
in addition to using the FAFSA. And then there are some colleges that have their own forms. So some colleges, just the FAFSA, some colleges, two of those forms, some colleges, all three of those forms. Um, the CSS profile becomes available October 1st. If you Google CSS profile, you'll get to the website. If you Google like CSS pro colleges requiring CSS profile, you'll get the list of all the colleges that actually require that. And I would say that parents, your kids who are applying to college have enough work to do. Um, this is something I would say you can go in as their executive assistant and find out where you need to do the CSS profile or where you need to do a college's own form. But um, if you're applying for need-based aid, you will have to do the FAFSA, but you won't be able to do it until sometime in December. And I think Bright Futures just opened up for the initial application um, or just opened, it opens up in early October, um, but you really can't complete Bright Futures until you you know you finish your senior year and you have all your grades but you can get into it and start your process in october my daughter seems to think she needs to be accepted to a university before applying for scholarships is that true um the question is my daughter seems to think she needs to be accepted to universities before applying for scholarships is that true the answer is no um there are, um again this is something that as executive assistants um parents can go in and do um, and you can Google, let's say, you know, Ithaca College or Hobart College or whatever college, um, scholarships, and you'll get to their scholarship page and you'll see what their rules are. Some colleges will automatically consider um, a student for a merit-based scholarship. Um, merit has to do either with academic merit or extracurricular merit. Um, it could even have to do with test score merit. Um, my own son got got one of those, but then again, he lived with the SAT lady when I used to, um, you know, tutor for the for the SAT. Um, so some colleges automatically consider you for scholarships at the time you apply. Some colleges um, also have particular scholarships that you can check off on the common application that you're interested in applying for. Um, some of them will then immediately direct you to their application. Some of them will. Um, you know, send you an application, you know, after the fact. Um, but parents, again, it's something that, that you can do. Um, you can go to a college, any college's scholarship page to see how that works. But no, please do not wait until after you're accepted, in most cases, to apply for a particular scholarship. But then it's probably, for almost all of them, might be too late. Last question. Uh, <laughs> How does college define and verify if a student is first generation? Okay, so how does colleges believe what you write on your application? You are signing something as a student at, at the end of your application, indicating that this is your work and that you have been completely honest. On Common App, it will ask where your parents, you know, each parent, you know, went to school or what their highest level of, of education was and so if i indicate that you know my parents highest level of education was high school then i'm automatically first generation um there are there's more than one definition of first generation some colleges define a first generation student as neither parent went to college other colleges define first generation as neither parent graduated from college um, or, you know, earned a, a four-year degree. Um, but you'll see that they're asking enough questions to be able to determine that mom or dad, you know, went to college. Okay, so um, if, if you have any, you know, additional questions, you can always write to hello at jraec.com. Um, or you know, give us a call or, or text us, and you know we're happy to answer. I just want to thank you all for um, being such a great audience and having so many wonderful questions. I hope that I was helpful to you. Oh, that was my questions page. Oh well, and just you know, thank you, and you know, give us a call if there's anything that we can do um, in any of our locations to help you with anything related to college admissions or tutoring or test prep or even courses for credit, all of which we do. Thank you. Have a Bye. nice evening. Good night.